So those three philosophical problems that I told you about earlier, it turns out that they are all solved when we start with God and when we start specifically with his invisible attributes that are clearly seen, his eternal power and his divine nature. When we start with the eternal power and the, div the divine nature of God as the foundation for our metaphysics, those three philosophical problems are solved. My name is Joel Sedecase. I'm a Christian apologist, husband, and the father of four kiddos. In 2009, I left my job in the business world to teach high school Bible at Chicago Hope Academy. That decision would set me on a journey that would bring me first to seminary to study apologetics and earn my master's in philosophy of religion, then into local church ministry where I became a youth pastor and eventually an interim lead pastor, and then to joining Crew and launching the Think Institute in 2019. Now, I'm on a mission to help fathers lead their families in defending the Christian message. I don't have all the answers, but I'm determined to go find them. And through this show, I'm reporting back to you, the Think Squad, what I discover. Welcome to the Think Podcast. Really quickly before we start, if you have an interest in the intersection of fatherhood and apologetics, as I do, as well as philosophy, theology, and many, many leather-bound books, I want to let you know about our online community, the Think Squad group on Facebook. There, you can join hundreds of other Christ followers also on the same journey. We trade apologetic stories and strategies, discuss philosophical and theological questions. It's like a huge late night bull session in your favorite cigar lounge. And it's actually led to some real life hangouts as well. So check it out, the Think Squad Facebook group. All right, well, welcome to session two of the Biblical Worldview course. My name is Joel Sedecase, and I am coming to you from about 50 miles west of Chicago in the Fox Valley region. And um, we are here tonight to talk about how to make sense of the world. How should Christians make sense of the world? How do we make sense of this thing that we call reality or human experience? So if you're just watching now, this is session two, and I want to encourage you to go back and watch session one, which is posted on YouTube, and uh, you can access on my website or on uh, the Think Institute website, I should say, and you can get that by going to thethink.institute. I'll put that up on the screen, that address. If you're listening to this later on the podcast, I want to thank you for listening. If you're watching on YouTube or uh, somewhere else, uh, we put out a lot of content like this around the biblical worldview and apologetics and how to share your faith and engage others with the gospel, because we believe that no follower of Jesus Christ should ever get caught flat-footed when asked about what or why we believe. And so what do we do? We seek to help dads lead their families in defending the Christian message. That is what we are all about at the Think Institute. So without any further ado, I'm going to give you some information at the end as to how you can partner with us and join our team, join the mission of the Think Institute. But uh, we need to jump into this content because we've got guys watching backstage right now as we speak who are enrolled in this course. Now, we, we put these courses on through the Hammer and Anvil Society, which is our discipleship wing of the Think Institute. And uh, if you want to know more about the course, again, you can get that that information at our website, uh, especially if you go to thethink.institute slash worldview. You can actually still join the course if you feel so inclined, or uh, you can watch the videos or listen to the episodes later. So let's jump in. Let's talk about, let's talk about what is around you right now. So look around you. What do you see? Okay. As I look around me, I see I've got a laptop, um, a desk, you know, my, my phone is uh, in the vicinity. Um, what about you? If you look outside, you know, maybe you see a tree, clouds, stars. What is 
all that stuff. What is all that stuff? Now that might seem like kind of a silly question, kind of almost a, a question that's too trivial to even ask. What do you mean? What is all that stuff? You know, the desk is a desk. The, the tree is a tree. It might seem absurdly basic to ask yourself the question, what is all that stuff? But if you really think about it, it's a question that bears asking. And there are philosophers who have dedicated their lives to answering that question. What is stuff? What is it? What is it? What is it all? You know, there was a famous philosopher, Socrates, who said that the unexamined life is not worth living. So examine your experience. Examine what's around you. In fact, let's take the tree, for example, that hypothetical tree that's outside your window. How do you explain what the tree is? How do you make sense of the tree? It's a tree, but what is that tree? Now, to explain it, you might want to go small. Here's what I mean. You might want to break it up and you say, well, the tree is made up of, of parts. Okay, you've got branches and leaves, roots. Uh, if you go even Internally, you've got, you know, xylem and phloem and sap. Uh, but really, if you get down to the molecular or to the microscopic level, a tree is made up of cells, plant cells, not animal cells, plant cells. And those cells are made up of constituent parts as well. There's the nucleus of the cell. And, the, and then, of course, uh, you, there's, there's all these other parts of the cell. But those parts are really, those are made up of proteins and DNA, aren't they? And proteins and DNA, that, those are molecules. Well, molecules, we could go even smaller than molecules. What are molecules? Molecules are made up of atoms that are bonded together. What are atoms? Well, if you remember your high school chemistry course, you've got different parts of the atom. You've got the nucleus, which is made up of protons and neutrons. And then there, there are electrons, which circle and orbit around in a cloud around the the nucleus, the nuclei. And okay, so is that what a tree is? A tree is protons and neutrons? Well, no, because you can go even smaller than that. Protons and neutrons and electrons, I mean, these are made up of smaller parts that we call quarks. They're up quarks and down quarks. And, and those quarks, what are the quarks made up of? Well, if you go down small enough, there are different theories, competing theories about what everything is made up of. String theory says... Everything's made up of strings, and the way that these strings vibrate is what gives everything mass. It's where matter comes from. Um, and then recently, it was in the news that there was something called the Higgs boson, which has been hypothesized to be the what, what's been called sometimes the God particle, the God particle, because it gives meaning to everything. It, gi it gives everything its substance. Uh, John Frame, in his book, We Are All Philosophers, one of my favorite theologians, says, in my unscientific way, I want to know what the strings are made of. And you know me, Joel Sedeckes, I want to know, I want to know something similar. I want to know what are the Higgs bosons made up of? It doesn't seem like you've really explained anything. You've just broken quarks and, and uh, other particles down into a, a smaller part. But what, what are those parts made out of? And you know, John Frame in his book, We Are All Philosophers, he, what he says is ultimately what many are saying now is that there is no fundamental particle. You can't go down small enough. As a matter of fact, when you go down to the subatomic level, or even you know the level of photons and, and protons and neutrons, what you might be dealing with might not actually be real particles at all, but something like pointers for the way that our meters read things. Now, this is getting really uh, almost esoteric. You know, I don't, you almost feel like you've gone into the quantum realm of, uh, you know, uh, the, the Ant-Man movies or, or the Avengers movies. You know, what, what exists at that level? And can we even talk about it in a meaningful way? Well, here's what we can know. When you get down to that kind of level, that subatomic level, there are no answers there about, about our tree. Remember, we started this whole thing trying to figure out what our tree is. Going down to the subatomic level does not give meaning to what the tree is. It doesn't actually tell us anything fundamental. All it tells us is that you can break things down into smaller and smaller parts, but there's nothing about a Higgs boson that tells me anything about a tree other than just, yeah, it's made up of Higgs bosons, I guess. So let's go in the other direction. Let's try to explain the tree in terms of the categories that it fits into. In terms of the relationships that it has categorically with other things that are like it. So let's, we'll, we'll go macro. 
Okay, instead of going micro, which is what we just did, we're going to go macro. All right, so let's think about the tree in terms of categories. So in my backyard, I've got a maple tree. And um, it's one maple tree, just you know, one tree. It's distinct from, from other trees. It's an individual entity in that regard, but it's a maple tree. It's, in that sense, it's got similar quali qualities and attributes to other maple trees. So we're going to put it in the maple tree category. And maybe that's going to give us some insight into what it is. Okay, and then... That, of course, raises the question, well, what are maple trees? Well, maple trees, that, that's a, a type of tree. There are maple trees. There are oak trees. There are birch trees. There are palm trees, although palm trees really aren't trees at all. I think they're actually a grass. They're a type of grass. Some of you guys who live down south can, can let me know if that's accurate, but I, I believe palm trees aren't even actually technically trees. Okay, so they're out of the tree category, but there are other trees that do fit into the tree category. So maybe we ought to think about trees in terms of their, rather in terms of their distinct and discrete parts. Maybe we ought to think of them in terms of wholeness, oneness. Let's try and lump all the trees together into categories. We'll say this is tree. This is treeness. What do all these trees have in common? And that's, we're going to analyze treeness and that's going to give us meaning to our tree. But here's the thing, we're going big. So why stop at treeness? Because trees, that's a type of plant. It's a type of the, the plantae kingdom. And plants all have certain things in common, don't they? They've got cell walls in common. They've got certain attributes. Um, they, they've, they've got chlorophyll. They make their own food. So we're thinking in terms of plants. Maybe we ought to think in terms, maybe we ought to go even bigger than plants because plants are one of the kingdom kingdoms of life. There's plantae kingdom, animalia kingdom. So maybe we ought to think of just our tree in terms of not only in the, the plant kingdom, but in terms of living things, living things as distinct from non-living things. So we've got life and non-life, but then there are certain things that sort of blur those categories. Like a virus is a virus technically alive. Yes. And no, it's actually debated. And there are, there are even certain entities, which it's not clear what kingdom they really fall into. So maybe we ought to think in terms uh, not just of living and unliving, but maybe just, you know, living and unliving things all have something in common. They're all material. So maybe we ought to just think in terms of material things. That maybe that's our ultimate category that's going to give meaning to that tree in the backyard. But now at this point, what are we talking about? Haven't we gone so broad that we're just talking about stuff? Does it really make sense to, to say that, thinking of our tree in terms of just being stuff, being material, being matter, does that really tell us anything about the tree? So here's the dilemma we run into. When we examine the tree or the desk or the laptop or anything else in our experience, if we examine it in terms of itself and we go smaller and smaller, it ultimately gives us no answers. If we go bigger and broader and think categorically, it still ultimately gives us no answers. We are left in this predicament. When we examine human experience, the cosmos, the world around us, in terms of itself, it doesn't give us any answers. Whether we go small, we can call that atomism, thinking of everything in terms of its constituent parts, atom, which comes from a Greek term meaning uh, unchoppable. Here's how I remember that. A, A, is a prefix that negates something. So amoral is something that is just not moral. Okay. A, Tom, means non-choppable. How do you remember choppable? What does a tomahawk do? Chops. Okay, so an atom, an atom, is, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm very much mixing cultures and languages here, okay? But I'm an American, I'm free to do that. We're a melting pot. Uh, so I just triggered everyone. So the... The atom, atomism thinks of things in terms of going into smaller and smaller pieces. Holism is the term that John Frame uses to describe H-O-L-I-S-M is the frame, is the, the John Frame term for thinking of things in terms of bigger and, and bigger categories. But neither one will give us ultimate answers about reality. But the question that we need to answer, and this is the first question in our study of worldviews is what is real? Or we might say, what is really real? 
That's the question that we are trying to answer. And appealing to an atomistic view or a holistic view does not give us the answers. What is stuff? What is reality? What is prime reality? Now, this study of of reality, the study of what is ultimately real, is often known uh, by, by the name metaphysics. Now, where um, where do we get the name metaphysics from? Well, in a sense, it kind of makes sense because we're thinking about uh, meta in the in the Greek means with or after, and metaphysics is sort of the study of what's after physics, what's behind the physical world, what's behind what we can see. But in reality, when the ancient philosophers came up with this term, it, they just happened to they needed a term for the um, the body of writing. I think it was Socrates. No, it must have been Aristotle's writings that they were um, that they were collating, that they were arranging. And it just so happened that his study of prime reality came after his study of the physical world, and so they just called it after physics, meaning it literally just came later in the notebook. It came later in the papers. So they called it metaphysics. And to this day, we still call it metaphysics. It's the study of what is ultimately real. Bound up with the study of metaphysics is the study of ontology. Ontology is the study of being. So when we talk about ontology, we're talking about what is, what what has existence. And we're talking metaphysics. We're talking about what is prime reality what is really real what is ultimate reality like what is stuff what is real and you know this question of prime reality has been a live question ever since the time of the ancient greeks ever since heraclitus said all is fire and thales said all is water it's been a live question ever since the five and six hundreds bc Now, there are other questions bound up with this question of prime reality. And these three questions are going to be what we really talk about in this lesson. There are these three philosophical problems that we want to try and and answer. Because when we examine human experience, here's what we find. There are different kinds of reality. Different types of, of reality have different attributes. So, for example, when we examine our world, when we examine reality, here's what we discover. Certain things exist necessarily, or at least they seem to. Other things have contingent existence. And there's this, there's this weird interplay and dichotomy between necessary and contingent existence. When I talk about necessary existence, I'm talking about things that it sure seems like they would have to exist in every possible world. An obvious example of this would be the laws of logic. The laws of logic are the law of non-contradiction, Two contradictory statements can't both be true in the same sense at the same time in the same way. The law of um, identity, which says A is A. A thing is itself, which seems obvious, but that's a law. It's obvious because it's a law. It's a law because it's obvious. And the law of excluded middle, A or not A, nothing in between. A statement is either true or false, one or the other. Okay, those laws of logic exist in every possible world. And if you want to say, well, that's, you know, that's a Western way of, of thinking about things, you know, that's not necessarily true. I could imagine a possible world in which logic didn't obtain logic. The laws of logic weren't necessarily true. Well, guess what? In a world like that, where the laws of logic weren't necessarily true, then it would be true that the laws of logic aren't true. And in that world, it would not be true that the laws of logic were true. So you see, you still have an interplay. You still have a law of logic operative there. The law of non-contradiction still applies in that world. Unless you're going to say in a world in which logic is not true, logic is true in that world. Well, now you're right back to having a world where logic is true. So the laws of logic exist necessarily. And that's perplexing to philosophers, to thinkers. How can... So, so certain things exist necessarily. They're, they're, they're immaterial. Laws aren't made out of matter. But we also have things that exist contingently. Contingent meaning they depend on something else for their existence. Con- conditions have to be right for these things 
to obtain, for these things to exist. I'll give you an example. You and me. We don't exist necessarily. I can certainly imagine a world in which Nick Smelser doesn't exist. It might not be a great world. I'm sure his wife and kids are, are certainly glad that he exists, but I can imagine a world in which he doesn't. He can imagine a world in which I don't. We don't exist necessarily. Conditions had to be right. Our parents had to come together. There are great grandparents. There was a lot of conditions that had to obtain, that had to happen first before we could exist. Matter, I can imagine a world with no matter, just a big empty world. There are things that exist contingently. And one of the great philosophical problems is which one gives rise to which? Do the laws of logic necessarily give rise to contingent things like matter? Do, do necessary laws like morality, like where it's always wrong to murder, can that give rise to something like a murderer? No, the laws of the necessary laws that exist necessarily don't have any causal power. And yet here we have all these contingent things that exist. And these contingent things seem to be governed by the necessarily existent laws. There's an interplay. There's an interaction between the two of them. How do we explain this? This is a philosophical problem. It's one that we have to explain. There are these aspects to reality, to real reality that we have to explain. Your worldview has to account for this. The next philosophical problem is oneness and diversity. Oneness and diversity. You've heard those terms before, haven't you? As a matter of fact, it sounds to some of you like I'm about to launch into a corporate training program because you've been through oneness and diversity trainings at your workplace. Oneness and diversity. It's a very hot topic right now. Everyone wants to know about oneness and diversity. How do we make these diverse things one? And how do we make this one entity, this team, this company, this whatever, respectful of the unique and diverse entities and individuals that make up the whole? How do we account for oneness and diversity? And furthermore, what is more prime? What is more primary? What is more ultimate in the world? Is it oneness or is it diversity? Or we might say plurality. Is it the one or is it the many? Is everything fundamentally one, as the Eastern religions say? Or is everything ultimately just a bunch of discrete parts, like materialism would say? We're just a bunch of atoms. We're just a bunch of cells. We're just a bunch of proteins. We're nothing really ultimately more than the sum of our parts. This is a philosophical problem, oneness and diversity. And finally, the problem of mind and matter, mind and matter. Now this, this is a corker. This is a real interesting one. As the Brits say, this is a real barnstormer. Why? Because in reality, we seem to have something like mind. I'm Here I am, I'm thinking. And I recently had a little debate discussion. I don't know if it was little. It was an hour long with uh, a guy named Tom Jump. He's a self-proclaimed atheist. I say self-proclaimed because if you know anything about me, I don't believe in atheists. That's a whole, whole other story. But what he said was that uh, he, he, he's banking everything on Descartes' co, uh, cogito, and I always, I always mispronounce that word, Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. And there are many people who believe that you can ground your experience, your explanation of ex experience, in the fact that here you are, you are a self and you exist. And therefore, from that, you can extrapolate out all kinds of principles about the world. Okay. You start with your own mind. And then from there, you can reason about reality. Here's the thing while that might seem self evident to some or even to many or maybe even to most, there are those who question that principle. I'll give you an example. I don't know if he's directly questioned Descartes, but Sam Harris, the famous or maybe infamous atheist, says that the self is actually an illusion. There is no self. Yeah, I know you feel like you're a self. It's, a, it's false. You're not a self. You know who else says that? Hinduism. Hinduism says that the self is ultimately an illusion, as are all distinctions between uh, entities. And yet here we are thinking about whether or not we have minds. It almost, it almost seems nonsensical, doesn't it? But how do we explain the interplay and the coexistence of mind 
and matter. There are different ways people explain this. Some some go towards panpsychism. They say everything has mind. Others say that the, the mind or the self is really just ultimately an illusion. How do we make sense of mind and matter? It's a philosophical problem that we need to explain if we're going to talk about metaphysics. All right, now, because this is a biblical worldview course, we really ought to talk about how the Bible, how the biblical worldview answers these questions. And thank God, as Christians, we aren't left to speculate. We have a key, and that key is found in Scripture. And the key is so obvious. When you understand what it is, it's so stinking obvious. You're going to wonder how the Greeks never came up with this. You're going to wonder how Sam Harris doesn't, doesn't see this or how the Tom Jumps of the world miss this. You're going to wonder how you never saw it before, if you've never seen it before. The answer is located in Genesis 1.1. What does Genesis 1.1 say? If you need to look it up, go ahead. But here's what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, right here, what we're getting, we're getting more than just an origin story. We're getting the true perspective on the world. We're getting the fundamental distinction between types of reality. There are ultimately, fundamentally, two different types of reality. There is creator and there is creation. There is creator and there is creation. And here's the big idea of today's lesson, of today's class. The key to understanding the cosmos, the world, human experience, the key to understanding it all is not to examine the parts in relation to themselves or even the parts in relation to the whole, but rather to consider it all, some and part, in relation to its creator. The key to understanding reality is to consider the created world in relation to its creator. So in Genesis 1-1, we have this creation-creator distinction, which is the most fundamental distinction in all of reality. There is God and there is not God. And the not God was created by God. We get this in Genesis 1, but of course we don't only get it in Genesis 1. We also get it throughout Scripture, but we get it in John chapter 1, verse 3. John chapter 1, verse 3 reaffirms the distinction between creation and creator, and interestingly and importantly, it also brings in uh, verses 1 through 3 also bring in the Logos, who we find out later is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, into the equation. Here's what John chapter 1, verse 3 says about the Logos, about the Word, who we ultimately know is Jesus. It says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. I'll read it one more time. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Again, we've got this distinction. We've got all of reality divided into two categories, the things that were made and the things that were not made. The things that were made were all made through Jesus. They were all made through Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is on the uncreated side. So what that means is any worldview that says that Jesus Christ is an angel or a celestial or the first and greatest of God's creations is, is right off the bat is unbiblical and false. Okay, because all creation is, all reality is divided up into created, uh, creation and creator, and Jesus is on the creator side. He is God. It's a very important distinction because when you are engaging in apologetics, when you're engaging with, with um, when you're having discussions with people about their worldview, you are going to run into people who have this view that Jesus is created by God. But that's that's unbiblical. If you're going to think of think about Jesus, you have to think of him in biblical terms. Okay, so when we think of creation in terms of the creator, we suddenly have answers to all of our philosophical problems. All right, um, let's let's think first. Let's think about unity and 
diversity. Remember in the beginning, we were talking about our tree and we were trying to trying to explain the tree in terms of its parts and then in terms of the categories into which it fits. We went micro first and then we went macro. Well, according to the biblical worldview, the world is not merely the sum of its parts. Everything is not merely particles. Atomism is false. Nor, on the other hand, is everything all one, such that we could, you know, lump all reality into, um, in, in, into just everything is one, uh, you know, as if every, as if we were pantheists or as if we subscribed to a sort of Hindu monism. We'll talk more about that at the end. Um, everything is not parts because, because unlike an atomism where everything is just broken down and there's no ultimate meaning unifying everything together, the Bible gives us meaning for those parts and explains how the parts fit together into meaningful wholes. But it's not as though the whole itself is just this amorphous um, spiritual or material blob of oneness. There are meaningful distinctions. There is real uni un unity reflected in the reality around us. So it does make sense to speak in terms of categories, to speak in terms of laws. Okay, we don't we don't have to speak and 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 analyze each tree individually we can think in terms of trees and treeness okay we can this is very important for science we can perform experiments on one type of tree and we can extrapolate out principles and laws about all trees just as an example on the other hand there is real distinction and diversity and uniqueness and individuality in reality personhood is real. The self is real, not merely illusory. So if we describe man in general, we still have a long way to go before we understand an individual person. And all you married men will vouch for this. You can't think you know what your wife wants just because you know what all women are like, something like that. You need to get to know your wife. And for you single guys watching this, Getting to know your prospective wife is an adventure. It's a roller coaster. And guess what? The process does not end when you get married. It's a lifelong process. Why? Because the self is real. We are real individuals. Okay, we can think in terms of women, men, humanity, those broad categories, but then there are, there's this, this beautifully cool adventure where we get to investigate individual persons, individual selves. We get to look at actual uh, discrete individual entities. So if we only try to understand reality in terms of reality itself, whether the parts or the whole, we will fail to understand it at all. If we only look at the parts, we won't understand the unifying principles that give meaning to those parts. If we only look at facts, we will never get to laws. Cornelius Van Til famously said that without God, we're left with just a bunch of discrete brute facts and laws that have no connection to those facts. And he compared it brilliantly, I think, to a whole bunch of pearls with no holes in them and a string with no beginning and no end. The string is like the law. The pearls are like the facts. There's no way to make that necklace. There's no way to thread those pearls and make a pearl necklace. We need some way of interacting the facts and the laws together, the categories and the individual entities, or we'll never understand reality as it actually is. So those three philosophical problems that I told you about earlier, it turns out that they are all solved when we start, not with just looking at creation, trying to understand it on its own terms, but rather when we start with God. And when we start specifically with two things, two attributes of God, the Bible calls them his invisible attributes that are clearly seen. Those two attributes are his eternal power and his divine nature. When we start with the eternal power and the, div the divine nature of God as the foundation for our metaphysic, as the foundation for our worldview, as the key that is going to unlock the treasure trove of understanding of this universe. Those three philosophical problems are solved. Okay, that about wraps it up for this episode. 
The Think Podcast is a production of The Think Institute and is produced by yours truly, Joel Sedeckes. The Think Institute operates under Church Movements, a ministry of Crew under the division of Crew City. To learn about how to support The Think Institute and my family tax-free, go to thethink.institute slash partner. I hope you heard something helpful today. I know I did. Remember, this is not goodbye. This has just been a short stop on the journey as we learn to lead our families in defending the Christian message. And we'll see you next time. Until then, I hope it made you think.